Go ahead. All right. Um, welcome everyone to Pride to the Pride event hosted by the Office of Vice Provost Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Anti-Racism at Memorial University St. John's campus. Before we start with our event, I would like to mention a few housekeeping things. Please note that this event will be recorded. Um, may I request all our speakers to speak into their mic, making sure everyone, and especially our guests who are joining us virtually can hear. And guests joining uh, via WebEx, please submit your questions in the Q&A section for panel discussion. Um, so my name is Adi, and my pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm a queer, non-binary migrant student at Memorial University working towards a Bachelor's of Business Administration with hopes to apply for social work in the coming year. I'm currently also involved in the memorial community as an EDI researcher and report writer, a social justice research assistant, and an experience supporter with the Student Experience Office. I also volunteer as a crisis responder with Kids Help Phone, as the co-chair of Migrant Students United NL, and as an organizer with the up-and-coming Migrant Action Center. Pride is a time for celebration, but also a time for protest. We take pride in our identities and honor the intersectionality and diversity within our community while acknowledging the Stonewall riots that started it all. The Progress Pride flag is also a reminder of the fact that we wouldn't be here today without the many queer and trans people of color who fought for our rights, especially black trans women and trans women of color. Pride is a protest, not a party. However, it is a celebration of ourselves as we explore and find our true selves and as we grow away from the unrealistic patriarchal and colonial expectations of cishetness. You are valid, we are valid, and we belong. I would now like to introduce Dr. Dolores Mullings, who will say a few words before we get started. Dr. Mullings is Memorial University's first vice provost, equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. Dr. Mullings has worked in community organizations, providing resources and services to individuals with complex lived experiences, including those who are survivors of war, torture, hate crimes, violent crimes, and genocide, as well as poverty and homelessness. She brings more than 35 years of human rights, equity, and inclusion experience in not-for-profit organizations and academia to her current role at Memorial. Dr. Malengs began her journey at Memorial as an assistant professor in 2009 and progressed to associate professor and interim associate dean of undergraduate programs. She is also the former chair of teaching and learning in the School of Social Work and the recipient of the President's Award for Outstanding Teaching Faculty. Her, disciplinary, her interdisciplinary scholarship explores decolonizing post-secondary education, mothering and parenting, mental health and wellness, LGBTQ plus concerns, settlement and integration, elders, olders, older adults, and adults living with or vulnerable to HIV using critical pedagogies, including anti-Black racism, Afrocentric theory, and critical race theory. Welcome, Dr. Mullings. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, that was kind of long, I would say. <laughs> um, so thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate those of you that are in the room and those of you that are on stage, which is in the room, and those of you that are online. But before I go further, um, we'd like to acknowledge the lands on which Memorial University campuses are situated or in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. And, you know, we're encouraged not to just read the land acknowledgement, but just to to remind ourselves that we're all implicated, regardless of your settler or not, uh, as a black person whose four parents are brought to the Americas, forcibly I'm not a settler, um, but I'm also implicated as everyone else in this room to um, the atrocities that's been committed against um, 
uh, indigenous peoples. So I encourage us to sort of like think about how we're implicated and what it is we're doing to um, transform the systems of colonization that we live in today and that um, impacts um, indigenous peoples, the various groups of indigenous peoples. So as you ponder that, I'd like to introduce our special, our guest, you can tell they're not used to this. <laughs> I'd like to uh, welcome our special guest, Santiago Guzman, who is uh, in uh, the audience, um, Bethany Jacobs on stage far left, um, Xavier Campbell next to Bethany, and Daisy Jeffries um, next to me. So I'd like to really, from my heart, thank all of you for being here today and for agreeing to work with us. I know this is July. I'm not used to um, this program in July. Um, the International Pride Month is June, and as you may or may not know, St. John's celebrates um, Pride in July. I understand because of the bad weather in June, that doesn't work so well for Memorial. So we're going to try from the perspective of my portfolio, we're going to be going with the international flow of June next year. So we appreciate you being here um, and know that you've taken time out of your day to consider not, you know, to being here and to share pieces of yourself with us. Um, we will honor that space that you're creating for us, and we will ensure that you're not traumatized or harmed in the process of sharing your art and pieces of you with us. So during Pride Week then, um, as I just said, the St. John's um, celebrate two S LGBTQ plus peoples. And as Adi said, Pride is a celebration um, and I'll add that it's one of visibility and a celebration of all things LGB, 2S LGBTQ. And so we are here to help with that celebration again by um, being exposed to some art from our guest on stage. Um, just make sure. And during Pride Week, we also reiterate here at Memorial University our commitment. So I can speak for myself as the Provost of, um, of Vice Provost of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Anti-Racism, that I am wholly committed to helping to transform Memorial University. So it is a place where 2SLGBTQ peoples, students, staff, faculty, alumni, anybody that touches Memorial is respected, honored, and welcome. I am one person. There are two of us in the portfolio at the moment. It is a long stride uphill, but guess what? People before me have done much more which, with much less. If you just think about the histories, indigenous, I'm um, sorry, um, uh, the history of twist LGBTQ people with no, October, right? Is the, I'm sorry, October is 2S LGBTQ History Month, I think, right? Is it October? Nobody knows. I think it's October. Anyway, we'll find out in October if it is or not. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is I'm wholly committed to ensuring that, you know, whatever programs, uh, policies here at Memorial, that I have a contribution to ensuring that we not only eradicate, but transform our systems and processes so that, you know, everyone can feel um, welcomed and honored, as I said before. Um, and I'm just making sure here. Just want to also say that Mansu has been tremendous in um, showcasing um, pride. Um, this past week and the rest of the week, and we honor the work that they're doing as well, and we encourage you to support the different programs that they have out there. And um, so that I don't take up too much time from our star attractions, I will uh, close by just again saying that 
uh, memorial will be celebrating its 100th year um, later on this year. And I know that our president and um, um, other senior level administrators are planning something spectacular. I will have an opportunity to contribute to that. And I, you'll know that I will be ensuring that it's not um, just 100 years of on the surface things, but 100 years of things that we have not seen, including to us LGBTQ experiences here at MUN. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Malengs. I would not, now like to introduce our moderator, Santiago Guzman. Santiago, he, him, they is an award-winning playwright, dramaturg, um, performer, and director originally from Metepec, Mexico, now based in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. He is the artistic director of TODOS Productions and the Artistic Associate for Playwrights Atlantic Resource Center. Santiago's work as a writer aims to put local underrepresented narratives and characters on the front lines whilst inviting audiences to appreciate the vibrancy of Newfoundland and Labrador from a diverse perspective. Their work has been supported, developed, and are produced by theater companies and festivals such as TODOS Productions, Newfoundland and Labrador, Resource Center for Arts Theater Company, Newfoundland and Labrador, Artistic Fraud of Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador, Rising Tide Theater, Newfoundland and Labrador, Neighborhood Dance Works, Newfoundland and Labrador, Eastern Front Theater, Nova Scotia, PARC, Pan Atlantic, Ships Company Theater, Nova Scotia, Theater New Brunswick, New Brunswick, um, Boca del Lupo, British Columbia, Paprika Festival, Ontario, and the National Theater School of Canada's Art Apart Program, Quebec. Most recently, Santiago's play Earn received the Senior Dramatic Script Award of the Newfoundland and Labrador 2022 Arts and Letters Awards and was shortlisted for the NLCU Fresh Fish Award 2022. Santiago's work is very gay, very brown, and very real. Representation matters. Welcome, Santiago. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, gonna put my notes here. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sherry and Dr. Mullings, uh, Adi and, and Paul for um, setting this beautiful event today um, and for the lovely introductions. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Santiago Guzman and I am a playwright. I am a writer. Uh, but today, I am going to be the moderator of this beautiful event, and I am so excited that um, the uh, EDI, uh, A, 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 R, thank you, English, oh, geez, um, is, is inviting us all to celebrate uh, Pride. I think that um, I, I am an alumni from Memorial University, and I wish there was this uh, um, portfolio uh, when I was uh, a student, because I would have felt less alone uh, as a queer brown immigrant trying to uh, navigate the, the white institution. Um, but uh, I am very, very excited. And, and I think uh, I want to also make some space to thank do, uh, Dr. Mullings for um, mentioning the land acknowledgement. I am an immigrant. Uh, I come from Metepec, Mexico, uh, which is also uh, Mexico is a colonized country. And I believe in, in land acknowledgments as uh, taking a moment to recognize that I am also a guest. And uh, my experience as an immigrant has helped me see that there are um, obviously that my country has also been colonized and has um, a, a different and a complex history as well. Uh, uh, and I totally agree with uh, what we should be doing in educating ourselves here in this context and learning about the indigenous communities uh, in our beautiful province. But at the same time, I would encourage us all to also highlight, foster and amplify uh, indigenous joy, indigenous art, 
I think that is very, very important to, to me, and I invite you to do that as well. Um, so uh, today we're going to have uh, some readings from uh, three beautiful artists in our community. Uh, these um, uh, pieces are different uh, and in form and in themes. Uh, and then um, after that, we will have a conversation, a Q, a, an A, a little chat, a little yarn. Um, but so I will be uh, calling um, each uh, artist one by one, and they will be presenting their work. So um, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, so let's start with Daisy Jeffries, uh, an artist and writer, educator raised in the Bay of Exploits of, on the northeast coast of rural of um, there, uh, her work is deeply informed by geographies and histories of trans women and sex workers in Atlantic Canada. Her research creation and multidisciplinary projects have been exhibited in a lot of places like Eastern Edge, St. Michael's Print Shop, uh, Cape Breton University Art Gallery. And um, one of the things that I was very interested in Daisy's work is that um, uh, she's very interested in uh, counter narratives in um, uh, dreaming about what is beyond what we what has given to us, what we have been uh, assuming as the norm, and uh, to think about the possibilities of what the world should actually be in the in the art. Um, Daisy will be reading some poetry today, so welcome to the stage, Daisy. Yes, please clap. Don't be shy. Clap, clap, clap. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago, Dr. Mullings, Adi, Cherry, Paul, Darcy, and others involved in organizing the event today. Um, I'm really excited to read alongside Xavier and Bethany. Uh, I'm going to read some poetic fragments from an ongoing manuscript in progress titled Ocean Leaving. Every strayed thing I remember to say now you don't have ears, but listen still. With hours and borders and blue holes between us, our worlds fall short of encounter for years in the North Atlantic contact zone. When ghosts of other trans femme whorefish hit the harbor, a flesh tether undetermined, see-through and edgeless together with the grief of a kin-worn gillnet, is willed further east, crossing sea-touched horizon. In this timeline of counter-narratives, you are communities of trans women sex workers held apart by cultural loss. I lose you as I enter institutional archives and feel you again near the water's threshold. Your histories of movement are safer here. Held against possessions harbored, worlds engender immutable touch. Futurity foundering, deep water distance. Together we capture a blue transhistoric. Relentless and wave slow, extractive aquasexual love form unfathomed become with the body softly release these ciliated echo ends here to wash over an interstitial heart a tea girl floating in seawater beckons who on the land will laugh or listen I have decided that my favorite color of the rainbow is blue. I see you in soft blue streaks on the water from a glace bay cliff where the lobster boats gather. No one has taken their traps away yet, but I am not a fisher person, only a poet, and home is just another word for blue these days. 
hugging you hard on the wharf loop beach rocks. You would smile and show me a missing front tooth that you just lost yesterday, and then stick your little blue sucker-stained tongue through the gap, and it would make me laugh, and you would laugh because you loved me. Now what a gift after all this time that I have not forgotten how it feels to be an island, wanting to hold and honor your past and ask you to remember if it hurt to move away from here because your dad and brother lost their jobs at the plant, but also because your outport wasn't safe for someone transient. Even though I was always there too, I dyed my hair blue with Nan's old food coloring a few months after you left for Toronto, staining every surface of the bathroom and my sticky fingers needing to carry your color this close since there wouldn't be any more summer night sleepovers feeding each other sour skittles in your tent no tasting the ark or telling me a word for who you really are inside no tickling you foolish in the blueberry bog or stunt double riding on the back of your bike that didn't have brakes and made us unstoppable. I wrote you a letter and sent it by sea, but I guess it hasn't made it to the mainland yet. Blue by the minute, girl. Stay right there and look how lovely you become. Measure our proximity with 50-year-old fishing rope the still unfathomed, you are salt-hearted. This neighborhood paved over burial grounds where we build another whorehouse, century old by the breaking simulacra of a harborside cosmetic mirror, darker than the former, upper east to lower west, weathered by a fog rolling in from the Grand Banks, every shadow a bother but you. Turn into smoke, I wish I could swallow and hold you here for tens of years, or at least until the Umbra remembers how to decipher. When I finished topping a first-time client and you made your way downstairs plugging your nose, swore laughing that my bedroom smelled like a barn. When I had to turn up my white noise machine at three in the immoral morning, would would not sleep through the sound of a traveler stretching you open for a discounted rate. Even though I didn't hear you say it back then, I believed the cry for help. Then you swallowed me, bones and all, there at the gleaming gray water's edge, still uncaptured by a coral panic. We even gave your queer heart a name, halfway life form, ancient mermaid. Won't you remember just how hopeful? Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. That was absolutely beautiful. I was captivated by your reading. Wow. My favorite line was, home is another word for blue uh, these days. Ah! Anyway, um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that, Daisy. Uh, that was really, really beautiful. Thank you. Uh, our next reader uh, is um, uh, Xavier Campbell. Uh, he was born and raised in Jamaica, and, uh, but has considered Newfoundland and Labrador for a decade. Um, obviously, there is a, a clear distinction between these two islands, but uh, Xavier, feels, uh, Xavier feels that living in Jamaica prepared him for the life on the rock. 
minus the snow, sleet, and lack of sun, obviously. Um, uh, his fiction has been published with, with um, in the Malahat Review, Riddle Fence, Breakwater Books, and uh, Apple uh, Apple Beard uh, Editions. Um, Xaver is really interested in reimagining as well the possibilities of what um, uh, art could look like in terms of representation. Uh, he hopes to give young people this sense of freedom in his writing and, and to really write something that he wished he had seen uh, when he was uh, reading at a young age. Um, thank you, Xaver. Come, please come and, and enchant us with your reading. Please, a big applause for Xaver. Thank you, Santiago, for that introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Dr. Mullings and Cherry and Ari, thank you, everyone who's put this together. I am really honored to get to share my work amongst these exceptional other artists. Wow, Daisy, that was amazing. Um, OK, so I'm reading from Us Now. It's an anthology filled with writings from new New Newfoundlanders, um, new Newfoundland literature, racialized minorities. Um, my story in this is called Prayer. And here we go. Okay. Ever since my first kiss with Como on that hot early September day under the Nesbury tree in my yard in Jamaica, I had been longing for the feel of another set of lips on mine, specific lips, even though the only other set of lips I had ever felt were Como's. It had been three years since that kiss, but I haven't forgotten his soft, tender, pinky brown, full lips. Those forbidden lips haunted me, our illicit kiss untimely interrupted by my angry mummy. Now a girl named Sandy was trying to steal kisses from me. The first time she tried it, I jumped at the opportunity. Girls kissing boys was what was normal. Even as a little boy, I was desperate to feel normal and to eventually end up in a biblically sanctioned boy-girl relationship. When Sandy wanted to go past kissing one day after school, I obliged. Sandy's house and mine were identical, as were all the houses on the lane. Her house was completely red, including the front door, while ours was green with white trim around the windows with a blue door. Sandy's mom was a seamstress, and she had a cement wall, teal-painted dressmaking shed in the front of their yard instead of a mango tree like we had. After school, we were either in her yard or mine. You want to play doctor? She asked one day after school. We both attended Halfway Tree Primary, and even though we took the same bus to school and back home again, we didn't roll in the same circles while at school. Sandy had never wanted to play doctor before. I figured this was something she learned at lunch when she disappeared with a group of giggling girls. How you play that? Come here and put your ears upon my chest and listen for my heartbeat. I did as I was told. We set up our doctor's office under my dining room table. Mummy had staggered an oversized square gold tablecloth beneath a smaller, narrower, rectangular purple tablecloth. The billowy gold fabric cascaded onto the dining room floor and provided the privacy Sandy and I needed for our game. I have inherited my mother's love for the drama that comes with extra large tablecloths, and I own one in practically every color. How does it sound? Sandy asked, giggling. I mean, I know how it for even sound, I, sat, I said as I sat up. Maybe if I lift up my shirt, you will hear more. If it sound like a knock, she said, exposing her gray training bra under the white school uniform blouse all the girls at Halfway Tree Primary had to wear. You can use your hand and feel my pulse too, she said, grabbing my hand with hers and placing it under, on the underside of her wrist. She narrowed our gap, forgetting that my ear somehow needed to be placed by her heart to hear the life-affirming sounds. I quickly realized the game was over when I felt her tongue in my mouth. Maybe it was the rapid escalation of events under the tablecloth. This kiss did not make me feel as good as when Como kissed me, but I kissed her back. Daddy moved to London full time by the time I turned 12, and we moved into a new, smaller house. It was near a bigger church, and mummy decided it was best for me to be as immersed in Christianity as humanly possible. She joined the church board and I the quiz team. 
I studied the book of Genesis for three weeks in preparation for our first practice. But all that went out the window the moment I walked into the room and saw him for the first time. This high color, yellow skinned, lanky boy with a big, a big curly afro. He was the only other boy in the room and I couldn't take my eyes off him. The jitters once associated with reciting Bible verses from memory had been replaced by thoughts of how I was going to get this boy to play doctor with me. His name was Kareem, his dad was the pastor, which basically made him royalty, a prince. We were new to the church, but just after two weeks, mommy also volunteered to be the church secretary, which gave me some standing in the hierarchy. It at least meant both Kareem's family and mine would get free lunch at church and would have seats reserved in the dining room of the church office. Over time, we bonded mostly because we only had each other. There were other young boys at this church, but none of them were stuck there with their parents like we were. Proximity and circumstance would see to it that our bond would flourish and my desire to play doctor with this boy would hopefully come to fruition. You want to come sleep over my house after church next weekend? I asked a coyly. We had been friends and teammates for a few months. We had enough quiz material to keep us busy for two more months of solid studying. Unfortunately, the general convention and competition was only a month away. Our sleepover, just a prolonged Bible study session. And this was plausible enough for both set of parents. Parents who would never consent to anything untoward towards two between two boys. The house, the new house that we moved into was smaller than our old one. And before Kareem came over, I cleaned my matchbox bedroom meticulously, laid out all my best toys and dusted the TV screen. What would he think of my room, my Britney Spears posters or house? Everyone knew pastor's house was basically a mansion and they had two hired helpers and five acres of land. This piece of gossip was probably the most talked about bit of information on the lips of the saints of the church. When I eventually laid eyes on the house myself, I saw that it was indeed a mansion nestled in the lush green hills of Upper St. Andrew, but they only had one acre of land. The other two sold to their neighbor to start a banana farm. They did have two helpers, Doreen for housework and Monroe for yard work. Our house was in the middle of the city and a quarter of the size of the pastors. We didn't have a helper. We had Granny's best friend, Miss Kathy, wash our clothes once a week. Mommy ironed my uniforms for school until I was 12. And we didn't have a gardener because we barely had any a yard. Just a row of flowers Granny planted along the front fence and a blacky mango tree that predated our occupation of the property. Kareem's parents dropped us all home from church the night of the sleepover. They drove a large minivan, big enough for Kareem, his two sisters, both his parents, and me and mommy. It wasn't even a tight squeeze. I'm going to skip to the end. Okay. All right. We had one church service before Kareem would go to Universal Camp in Portland for the rest of the summer. He was our representative from the church this year. It was summertime in Kingston and the church was packed as usual. All the serious children sat in the first in the first three pews and as the son of the pastor and the church secretary, even if we weren't serious, it would generate too much gossip for us to be anywhere else. All of us had started to timing the opening prayers. It seemed as soon as the weather heated up and the sweat involuntarily formed on all our foreheads, the saints needed to pray harder, longer, deeper, and more energetically. The front pures had recorded a whopping 27 minute prayer from Deaconess Jones three weeks ago. When we saw Pastor Sophia get up to pray, we knew the record was about to be shattered. She began, merciful, eternal, heavenly God, thank you for your blessings. You are the most high God, the King of Kings, the Jehovah Jireh, the Prince of Peace, El Shaddai, you are eternal, Alpha and Omega, and we started the timer. Gracious, eternal, blessed God, she continued. We checked, and it had been three minutes of her performance, performing glorious salutations to God. We braced ourselves for the length of this God-man conversation. Want to find some juice? Kareem whispered to me. Lord God, them can buy a little AC for the sanctuary. Most people would say this as they trickled out of the hot church into the 30 to 1 degree weather. Our offering can't help cool we off too. They continued, alluding to the fact that the pastor's home and office were both air conditioned, paid for by our congregation. <laughs> once, armed, 
Once armed with snacks, we made our way off the church property. I had never left church by myself before. Mommy was clear that I should never wander off, and I didn't consider this to be wandering off. I trusted Kareem to have a plan. As quick as it takes me and my husband now to walk from our doorstep on Queens Road to the harbor front, Kareem and I walked from church gate to the ferry terminal downtown. There were men selling roasted peanuts and red and white coconut cakes. Windscreen wiper boys were waiting at the stoplights with bottles of soapy water, hoping a paused motorist would reward them for a job well done. The mango lady with her oversized basket filled to the brim with all kind of mangoes sat on top of the wall that ran along the harbor. We walked down to the giant rocks by the shore where the ferry pulled in and sat on them, watching the waves roll below us. Eventually, we stood up and pretended we were walking on water as we hopped from rock to rock. When we tired of that, we started skipping rocks. Kareem always wanted to go another round. I said yes so often that we had to run back to the church once we realized we had been gone for 30 minutes. Under the shade of a large June plum tree, Kareem suggested we take our shirts off and fan them in the wind to speed their drying. Mas Joe, the groundskeeper at the church, lived in the apartment in the back of the churchyard above the June plum tree, but he never stuck around during church hours because there was bad blood between him and the saints. We fanned our shirts until they dried, and Pastor Sophia was still praying. It had been 40 minutes. Kareem laughed and said this, sanction, this, and said this outing was sanctioned by God. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Saver. Uh, the, my favorite moment <laughs> was when um, uh, when the, the main character says, uh, when they see Kareem for the first time and they say, I wonder how am I going to make him play doctor with me? <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Saver. Um, our, our final uh, reader for today, uh, the last but not least, for sure, is um, Bethany Busu. Bethany Jacobs is a cis female Anishinaabe queer two-spirit and ace activist. They have participated in planning the ACECON for the UK throughout COVID as the conference was online. They are in interested in building and sustaining nurturing relations amongst communities, which involve their intersectional identities and experiences. Uh, Bethany uses poetry, songwriting, and acad academic writing with themes such as indigenous trauma and resiliency, with the objective um, to heighten indigenous feminism, theorist, and um, uh, decolonize work as well. Uh, Bethany is working from a sociological, so sociological pardon me, and gender studies-based perspective. Bethany sees art as a practice which can cultivate restorative justice and relational vitality amongst different relations, which we have as humans, and believe that through artistry, such as writing, people can become more introspective and connecting within all my relations. Uh, Bethany will be reading some poetry today, so please welcome to the stage, Bethany. Thank you so much. Hello, hello. Um, Buzu is uh, hello in my own language. Unfortunately, English is my first language and my mother tongue is Anishinaabe Ojibwe and I was not able to learn that growing up because of colonialism. So, yay. Um, because of you both, I have a renowned respect for lobster cages, oceans, the color blue in lollipop style, and also um, fairies and peanuts, so thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here with everyone, and I have much respect for Dr. Mullings and um, the organizers of this event, Cherry, Jennifer, uh, Paul, um, Paul's co-worker, Darcy, and <laughs> um, Santiago. So thank you for inviting all of us here. Um, the first poem I will speak with is a poem I wrote yesterday. Uh, so I previously emailed the two organizers a poem that I wrote a year ago, but life happens and new poems come. So this one, because it was wrote yesterday, doesn't have a name. <clears throat> okay. Who I am. 
is not what you tell me. Trying to separate the forces of reality and tear the pieces of my essence apart. To fit into boxes, colors, which separate beauty apart. Beauty is but an object which you control what's to hold. And nonsense is a feeling that things cannot exist together. Whole. The mantra of my past life and the pain which brought me close to seeing dark clouds suffocate my dry, weary, sad soul. The pain which brought me close. Who am I? Is more than your perspective of reality. Is more than human perception of what we can hold loud and clear. Because who I am is a galaxy. Um, sorry. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> oh, there we are. Because who I am is a galaxy of colors, stories waiting to be seen, to be heard, to be found, to be validated, cherished, to become clear. And no, I do not mean crystal clear as crystal clear water where you look into an ocean and see all of the continents without question. I mean clear as fully flowing in a storm of fog, gray, shadow, and shame to come out on the other side and show one can stay well and alive even in the midst of chaos and pain to see the colors which go beyond human eyes human perception and not try to box freedom in to definitions which can be described by words alone but clear means acceptance and journeys which become whole to acknowledge the mess which stories behold and the fogginess that not does not hold us down but shows us how to fly on the waves which were meant to make us drown. Beauty is acknowledgement that well things will not be boxed in and straightforward ideal and sunshine on the days they still exist as a whole and that's a story of brilliance to be made beauty is when we tear down strongholds which instructed us how to be then let the colors flow in a new realm of our personal and collective galaxy so that's the first poem and the second poem is one I made in a gender studies class a year or two ago, COVID, so we don't know what year it was. Let's be real. And this is about my uh, two-spirit identity trying to reconcile <laughs> my faith and my indigeneity. So, in smoke I cleanse, in smoke I rise, not defined by colonial eyes. Beyond regret, Beyond chains ties, smoke once created a invisible way of life, a atmosphere of disappearance with no way to abide. And thrust into restitution, we we are pair, united. And smoke were not cloaked by shame, but cleansed by medicine to see what we may gain. Our law is love respect and honor. Our way is knowledge, wisdom, truth. Our law is not gender. Our law is not binary. Our law is not race. The fire which tried to rid our lives, indeed, instead, a renewing feel. We are not garnered by others' minds. Walking the terrain, challenge to go beyond the night, beyond the solemn identifiers of our identities bite. We praise Mother Earth with gratitude and honor for being the foundation of Earth's heartbeat and soul. We honor Mother Earth 
for breathing beauty into creation's lungs, for renewing sustenance and care and giving equal life. Together we stand uncovered, valuable, vulnerable, clothed with dignity and trust, unveiled and loved. We come with our ancestors to share a present reconciliative reality while inviting life's complexity we cleanse, medicine heals. We're strengthened to reignite courage. No barriers do. Reminders of relations within. We ride, we rise. So thank you. That was so beautiful, Bethany. Thank you so much. Um, I loved uh, when you say, who am I is a galaxy of colors and stories waiting to be seen. I was like, oh. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, as you can tell, we have a lot of talent with us today. Uh, I am very inspired. I wrote all of the things that puncture me uh, through your reading. So thank you very much for sharing. Uh, so this is a time for us to have a little conversation. And um, before we, we uh, I have some questions because I'm a curious individual. Um, I'm going to let you ask a question if there is anything that you would like to ask the panelists or uh, you um, on the interwebs, if there is anything that you would like to ask the panelists. Uh, this is your moment. As an icebreaker, I will start with my questions. Um, and I am just uh, curious as to what brought you to writing? What was the thing that led you to pursue this, this craft? And we can go um, whoever, popcorn style, whoever wants to go first. Mm. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, so, I guess what led me, I, I'd like to think that maybe it was accidental, probably, like how I got there was an accident. Uh, I, I just did a creative writing class with Lisa Moore, a workshop, and yeah, she is quite inspiring and like t really picks your brain, and I guess she un unlocked something inside of me, like some hidden vault of uh, stories that was just waiting to be told. And I guess I am a reader, so I really wanted at that point, you know, to start reading things that I wasn't reading or I wasn't seeing being offered on the bookshelves like all the time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, now I get to write these things that is that should be out there, but I'm not seeing out there. And I guess when I realized I couldn't stop, um i was like i guess okay this this might be a, a serious thing so yeah <laughs> i love that thank you saver uh anyone else bethany or daisy nobody wants to hear the mic squeak with each other <laughs> um so i guess i wrote my whole life as a coping mechanism to be social worky. Um, and then later on, I just got inspired by a few um, authors, including like Jamie Arpin, Reese, um, Thomas King, Brene Brown, Anais Lumba, etc. So they're pretty eclectic. There's some that write about just like queer theory, there's some that write about um, academic anti colonial um, topics. But really at the heart of it all, um, has been both the healing piece, but also the desire to um, have people more involved in the writing community who understand the intersections of our own identities and lived experiences. And also um, being able to present things which people need to hear. Um, you know, growing up in the complexities of my own lived experience, I always like kind of rested upon writing um, in other people's stories to be able to process my own. And I hope to do that and help present different ideas and perspectives of how to process life for those who are curious as well. Thank you so much, Bethany. Thank you. 
Uh, Daisy, what about you? So like Bethany, I was writing for pretty much my entire life. My mom and I had a reading practice every single night. So like she introduced the love of words and language from an early age. Um, I guess as a teenager, it became similarly a coping mechanism, a form of expression, and also a creative language. Access to literature in rural Newfoundland, at least the part where I um, grew up, was fraught for many reasons. Um, so writing kind of offered me a space to create my own world through language and think about the interiority of my own life, creative writing in particular. And my work kind of bridges creative and academic forms, but I've been learning um, from my positionality in academia that I don't want to give the institution these kinds of knowledge about trans and sex working worlds um, through research in ways that really don't give back to communities. So I think creative writing allows a way forward and thinking about counter narratives that offers something else. It offers a different possibility, but primarily it's a form of release for me. And I just feel lucky that my work has been mentored by people like Jude Benoit um, through study with people like Sonia Boone um, and through like a citational reading practice, but a, a community of people have held me up and I feel really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, yeah, the, there are so many, many things that the three of you mention and that I obviously uh, resonate with. And, and I think for in my perspective and in my approach to writing, I think that I, I came here to become an actor. That's what I wanted to do. But because the industry, uh, the, like the, the theater industry, has a lot of problems uh, when it comes to racism and discrimination, I couldn't see myself on stage. The parts that I was being given were not representative of who I was. And if there were parts that they were trying for me to do, there were stereotypes that were harming my identities. So I embraced writing as an act of rebellion. I said, you know what? You think that I don't have a space here? Let me show you that I do. And that's how I, how I embraced uh, writing. And, and uh, in a very similar way, you know, like you write things, you write little stories, but then it becomes your job, <laughs> which I am not complaining now. Uh, but, but it is really interesting how for us try to embrace and to heighten uh, our identities in, in a in an honest and legitimate way that is moving away from harmful stereotypes, which is really, really great. Um, there are some uh, comments and questions coming from um, our attendees online. Uh, one comment says, thank you to all of the speakers for sharing their art and experiences. Well, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, another question is, um, which is similar to what uh, Bethany was sharing about these uh, writers that inspire you, or um, what are what are you looking forward to reading? Uh, is there anything else, like a, a writer that you um, uh, admire or that uh, whose work inspires yours? We're going, I guess. Um, uh, funny enough, I just got a book in the mail. Uh, it's the follow up book to Call Me by Your Name. Ah! So. Um, well, I'm going on a writing retreat, and I'm like, this was going to be a good like way to distract myself while I'm supposed to be working on my own work. And I mean, that that was one of the books um, that I was just like, oh wow, like people are just writing about gay things like this and gay young people. So I really intrigued to see what is going to happen next, and I'm very excited by that. Yeah. Thank you. Bethany, is there anyone else? Um, honestly, if I was to be truthful, outside of like the regular published books, et cetera, kind of thing, there's a lot of really great talent that is often hidden here in St. John's. And I know we always like, we all see that with like people like Kelly Loader, um, who get on these big stages, but like downtown, there's a lot of spoken word. There's a lot of um, poetry that is shared. There's a lot of songs that are shared. And I would just say the champions here inspire me. Thank you. Daisy. I would um, build off what Bethany's saying about local talent and who has access to publishing and who doesn't a lot of the time and performance. Um, but I'm looking forward to forthcoming work. I mean, Riddle Fence seems to have a promising new 
publishing house. So I'm hoping there'll be, um, you know, diverse publishing there. I also want to um, highlight Rhea Roman in the back, whose book's coming out that I'm really excited for. Um, you know, one of my closest uh, collaborators, Violet Drake, is also one of my, we have like a sisterly writing practice. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I want to talk a little bit about the hidden and local talent and how these um, publishing houses are also, uh, you know, a way of, of uh, barriers to get to know writing. And, and it, this is uh, related to a question that came from um, our attendees online. And this question is about um, how can we better um, support, this is what the question says, uh, to SLGBTQ plus new artists as they find their voice in Newfoundland and Labrador, what support would help them make more art? Do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> if anyone's curious, I asked these beautiful people if we're still going in order, and we agree that we don't need to. Um, <laughs> I, a lot of the ways I've been supporting people is highlighting them on social media and through that resisting the counter narratives of shame that is often brought within our spaces. There's a lot of people I know who I call friends and um, because they have grown, they have flourished and they have became more and more who they are as a artist and as a human, they have been giving, um, given really hard spaces. And often with these hard spaces, people either set aside um, the opportunities to to celebrate these people and um, kind of uh, go with the status quo. And I would just say, don't do that. Celebrate people for who they are. Celebrate people for the gifts they have. Do not let um, people's comments and people's um, stereotypes online or offline in the narratives of shame which people try to bring as people flourish come in and and destroy them and destroy us um yeah and then also another important thing is to see people as a human see people as a whole um not just circumstances because we're in st john's because we're in newfoundland we have this tiny knit community where um there's gossip and such happening i would say don't use the gossip as a as a pedagogy to to describe how you will respond to people's um, progress. Respond to people's progress as a human, as somebody who has multiple lived experiences, as somebody who is growing, as somebody who, who has all the complex feelings and realities that you have as well. And go beyond yourself to encourage them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bethany. Anything else that Saver or Daisy would like to say about that? Mentioned, yeah, we live in St. John's and, you know, while we have, it's such a close knit community, I think we're also so lucky that, you know, I was over the weekend, I was at another festival and someone was saying that it's so close knit that you can support people a lot easier than if you were in a bigger city or whatnot. It is, you, you have it in your possibility to like, just go downtown or to go to the rooms or to go somewhere else or to go to mud or like, you know, to go somewhere within reach to support those who are local and who are nearby. Cause like you said, people are creating and they're putting out work. So it is just for the community to keep embracing all of this new work, especially when it's not like, you know, the big names and like the people who make it onto TV and whatever, because in mean, like every nick and cranny, there is something going on in this city. So it's just a matter of just like looking for it and just mm. probably walking out your door, even on nowadays, you can just watch it from your house. But yeah, so just those eyes really do help to like show that your work is validated and that your work is actually like registering to people outside of yourself. And that alone, I think is really, it's also incredibly important. Mm. Thank you, Saver. Uh, Daisy, any final thoughts or? Um, so again, it's like bringing both of that into context where there's been a, lots of amazing grassroots work done um, to bring artists together. I think Jude Benoit has been a key figure in community for bringing groups of queer and trans two-spirit and non-binary artists together from queer uncensored to the present and all their efforts. Um, and then it takes institutional efforts to, to bring artists together and support those voices. 
and arts institutions who are currently, you know, engaged in and certain projects. So I would like to see, uh, you know, Artanel maybe do a, a 2SLGBTQ plus grant writing exercise for, for queer and trans that. artists. That would be an opportunity. Um, and, and go from there. And I guess like uh, Violet Drake and I are, we're about to mentor this um, to us LGBTQIA plus storytelling series with the St. John Storytelling. Um, so that's an opportunity um, to work with queer and trans artists and to perform and uh, form a circle. So it's, I wanna see more of those initiatives keep going and it just, the labor that's involved to make that happen is, is circumstantial, but yeah, some of those thoughts. Thank you, Daisy. And and I think that these are really, really great points. And, and something that I would add is this notion of like showing up, you know, like show up to the reading of a queer author, buy a copy of their book, give them a shout out on social media, like show up. That's the work uh, that is important. The other thing, bring someone else along with you, introduce them to queer work. Um, or if you know of an uh, aspiring queer um, writer, share resources with them, you know, like connect them with people. And I think that part of like the community aspect of uh, St. John's, but I see that in Newfoundland and Labrador is that there is this very uh, strong sense of community and we are very reachable. Like we all have social media, we have emails and people can reach out and ask. Quite, I always open the door for people to ask questions. Uh, I may not have the answer, but I may be able to connect you with someone else. And I think that that is very, very important. And and I think, you know, uh, thank you to what, uh, for attending this question and for asking the question. I think this is this is vital as part of the engagement um, component. Um, I want to ask about inspiration. I want to 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 ask you um, about how does that inspiration comes to you. What, you know, is it, is it a something that you're walking down the street and then you say, oh, this is it? Um, so tell us a little bit more about your practice and, and the inspiration that leads or, or that um, ignites your work. Anyone want to start? Popcorn style. <laughs> Daisy. Daisy. Um, so water is an inspiration and um, mermaids are an inspiration in all of my work. So the figure of the mermaid emerges as this ancestor for queer, trans and sex working lives in this context. Um, and I guess like a lot of my writing practice is a moving practice. So I walk and record voice memos of a lot of my work and it's bringing the body into the work, um, centering the body in that relationship, I think also um, pursuing gender studies here at Memorial, studying with people like Sonia Boone, Vicki Hallett, um, Carolyn Darkangelis, uh, and seeing the interplay between feminist uh, theory and artistic practice. And that link has been really important. So pulling that out in the work is there. And I'm just, yeah, I guess I'm writing about rurality a lot of the time as well and with the environment and my positionality as a settler and challenging things and confronting whiteness, so on and forth in the work. Yeah. Thank you, Daisy. My practice, I really like what you said about it's moving. I would like to say that my practice is similar in that most of my writing does not get done in my office. It's usually while I'm swimming, while I'm doing laps, while I'm like hiking or just walking. People, all, a lot of the times in conversation, I'm usually like, that, like you say something and it really sticks with me. I think it's really funny or just like, it has cut me so deep. I like, I'm thinking about it for the next five minutes and I haven't heard anything else you've said. I'm just gonna go back to that line and I'm like, I, I must write that down. <laughs> and then I might use it in something. And then just like build a narrative around that. But yeah, people always just constantly are inspiring to me. And mm. as same way so in Newfoundland and this land and the ocean, like I, I am a water baby. And it's like either it's the pool or the ocean, just like looking at it or being in it. I always find like I can get, I get so much from just being one in the nature. And I am so grateful to live here that, that this land is just like rich with inspiration. So.
Ditto. Um, love the nature talk. Love the walking talk. Um, I get a lot of inspiration from observing people in society. Yeah. Observing people in systems and um, looking inside my heart and, and asking myself, how do I feel about this? And do I feel icky? Okay, so why? And do I feel, oh, and okay, why? And then just exploring that within myself and trying to be curious about um, how I'm per perceiving situations, how it impacts me, how it impacts other people, listening to people's stories, et cetera. Um, and talking about storytelling, like I wanna like just put a indigenous feminist plug in and say storytelling is part of my ancestral teachings and and and, and um, trying to reclaim my, my ancestral teachings in a way that um, I can as somebody who hasn't grown up through him. Um, I'm trying to reframe what storytelling can be. So finding inspiration in the little things to be able to use storytelling as a path of healing, both for myself and others is important, as well as um, finding inspiration in what I see are the gaps and in, in what people are given and how to how to fill them in in the way that people are given other opportunities to go beyond them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think my my writing practice is relatively new. Um, and and one of the things I feel like when I began writing, um, I saw writing in a very, you know, like fancy and like bougie way. Like I, I picture that writing was like writing at the at the feet of the the Eiffel Tower with espresso and a croissant. Uh, that's not what it looks like. Spoiler alert. So if you are trying to do that, yeah, that's writing will not take you there. Uh, well, it might. Um, but one of the things that I have come to understand and appreciate is that writing is, uh, I think that there is this understanding that writing is what you put on the on the page. It's a product uh, uh, oriented practice. And one of the things that I have to or that I have tried to um, see or explore is how writing can be way more than just words on a page when i am going on a walk and then writing is me thinking about my characters thinking about my plot uh thinking about the voices when i am talking to a friend about the narrative that i'm um, constructing when i am doing research listening to music that will feed my 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 practice i count that as writing and then by doing that i center care and kindness in the way that i work that is very, very different to what I expected writing to be. And, and I share that with you just because, you know, I think that for me, that was so helpful in, 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 in the way that I worked with myself because writing is a very solitary practice. So might as well, you know, enjoy while you're doing it. Um, my last question uh, to you, because we're running out of time, is, well, it's a two in one. What are you working on and where can people find your work to, you know, take in, to buy a book, to read an essay? What are you working on and where can people find you or your work? Saber. <laughs> You're writing. Um, right now I am working on a play um, for a Halifax theater for young people uh, called One Name. Uh, it's currently in workshops, and eventually I think it will come to Newfoundland, so people might have a chance to see it. That would be great. I am also working on a novel. Um, it's a challenge, like tackling mostly the same themes, themes that I write up and brought about today. And my work, Us Now, you can get this at Breakwater Books, and I think also at The Travel Bug and The Bee's Knees. And my short stories are in... Our journals that I guess you can order online. Yeah. Thank you. Buy them. The Malahat Review and Riddle Fence. Yeah. What about you, Bethany? Hi. So, as a student, my life is still engulfed by student life. <laughs> Um, and I also work on the side and I also volunteer a lot and I work part-time jobs as well. 
Therefore, I have little time to write professionally. Um, in the future, I do want to write at least three books. And then beyond that, just a lot of poetry and blog publications, um, and then academic writing. Um, one of my books is going to be about the, um, the weird journey of um, trying to figure out the faith and indigenous and intersectionality thing. Um, I, I once wanted to be a missionary and now I'm in social work. So just trying to figure out how to reconceptualize how we define community work is going to be one of my one of my books. Another one is going to be a little bit more personal on the trauma and resiliency scale. And then another one is just going to be a poetry and art book. So that will be there in 20, 10 years. Stay tuned. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, Daisy. I My writing practice has been slower in this past year. I've been making more visual art. Um, but I just, I'm working on a new grant project to write about sex worker histories and futures in these counter narrative ways that, that work against the historical record and the violence of history a lot of the time. Um, so I'm excited to begin working on that. I also have work coming out in the new issue of Riddle Fence, should be in a few weeks, and some other, some other places. I'm like notoriously not on social media <laughs> or posting, which I'm always working through. Um, but I have like open access reading on my website and, and yeah. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, to the three of you for sharing your talent and uh, some insight in this craft. Uh, for you folks, uh, thank you so much for attending today. Uh, please write these names down and follow their journeys. I implore you because they are quite fantastic. Um, so thank you very much for coming. I'm going to pass things back to AD. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, San Diego. Um, now we are, um, so we have drawn prizes um, for people who have attended in person and online. Um, the prize is a book by Michael Bach, um, The Alphabet Soup, The Essential Guide to LGBTQ2 Plus Inclusion at Work. Um, the online winner, winner is Carlin Best, and the in-person winner is Danielle. Um, Carlin, Jerry will be in touch with you regarding your prize. Um, and congratulations to our prize winners. Please see Jerry on your way out to collect your prize. Jerry will be connecting with the online winner to sort out delivery details. Um, on behalf of Memorial University's EDIAR office, I'd like to once again thank you all for joining us today, whether you are here in person or participating virtually. Um, we also have some nutritious snacks available for you um, in the back. Please help yourselves. <laughs>